Okay, I think we can get started now. Welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Anherid Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be with all of you today and to be uh, Starting off, kicking off uh, today's event and to see so many um, people joining us live from around the world, it's really exciting. Um, we're really pleased in particular at PHAP to be starting uh, this collaboration with ICFA, um, a central part of PHAP's mission, as many of you know, uh, and as was uh, determined by its global membership, is to convene inclusive, objective discussions on critical issues, uh, to facilitate a neutral platform for learning, looking at different perspectives, and ICFA having similar aims and also uh, really a strong focus on some specific policy issues that are of concern to NGOs is a great uh, partner in this regard and we're very excited to be working with them and I would like to now introduce my co-host uh, for today Melissa Patati from ICFA over to you Thank you so much, Anne Herod, and thank you all for joining. I see a lot of familiar uh, names in our chat and also some new names, so this is terrific to have you here. Um, I am the head of policy for ICFA, and for those of you who don't know, ICFA is a global network of NGOs dedicated to principled and effective humanitarian action. And this learning stream is part of a project of several learning streams on different humanitarian topics. The rationale for this particular online learning stream process arose out of ICFA's strategy and a desire we heard um, from our NGO network to have a stronger and a clearer understanding of the humanitarian sector. Of course, uh, once NGOs and humanitarians more broadly can better understand the humanitarian sector, we believe that we can provide um, more effective engagement and influence and improve the sector. Um, we want to introduce the idea of the learning stream on humanitarian financing. Um, the decision to focus our first learning stream on humanitarian financing was very clear. Um, it came very strongly from regional and global discussions surrounding the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, it, it came from the Grand Bargain on improving efficiency in humanitarian financing. NGOs were quite involved in both of those processes. And it just confirmed for us the importance to help NGOs and humanitarians more broadly better understand and better navigate a tremendously complex humanitarian financing landscape. Now, I have to say at the outset, there is no single approach to humanitarian financing. There is no one person or one organization who knows everything and who has all the answers. And we have very different points of view on specific aspects of humanitarian financing. And we should take these into consideration as we look at how to understand and improve the system. And so in ICFA, we definitely see the benefit of bringing together a wide variety of NGOs, uh, large, medium, small from all around the world and also um, come together with non-NGOs. So we're glad to see a really good mix here in terms of uh, the participation today's webinar. So as you might have seen already, the humanitarian financing learning stream is going to be broken up into a series of five topics. Each topic in the stream is comprised of a series of products, including webinars, live learning events, short whiteboard videos, and very succinct and easy to read uh, briefing papers that will be coming soon. Um, these products will then create a useful package um, specifically targeting but not limited to NGO staff. Um, the webinars and learning events are really the key flagship product of each topic and we've been very much looking forward to today. Um, before I hand it back over to Anne Herod, I just wanted to say we really appreciate the collaboration with PHAP. Um, we definitely see the power of networks and of providing peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, so we're very happy to uh, kick off today what we hope will be a very successful and informative uh, set of uh, products. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Melissa. And again, fantastic to have you here. Uh, and we look forward to working together for the, the coming months. Um, so before we get into the substance of today's topic, I'll just very quickly go through a few of the technical aspects of the platform. I know many of you have uh, been with us in previous PHAP uh, online learning sessions, but many are also new. Uh, so importantly, uh, first, we aim for these sessions to be very interactive and very responsive to the questions 
questions that you have on your mind uh, to really facilitate that that peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect. Um, at any time during the coming hour and a half, if you have a question uh, that you'd like to submit, um, please use the ask a question box that you'll find in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, then those will show up for us uh, here on the back end and we'll be able to work those into the discussion, uh, certainly in the Q&A at the end, but even uh, potentially during the uh, presentation. So please do have those questions coming in uh, throughout the event. Uh, we look forward to, uh, uh, to addressing as many as we can. Um, in addition, um, to increase the, uh, the interactive nature of today's experience, we'll be posing a number of poll questions uh, during the events at different points. Uh, so you'll see some of them will be multiple choice polls, others will be free text. Uh, we'll try to highlight these when they're about to appear, but if you see a poll coming up on the screen, as you do now, we have a, a test up here about whether you've participated in the past. Um, you'll see it come up on your screen. Uh, you can click there and then we'll look at the results together uh, and our, our guest experts uh, can comment on them, which will be interesting. Um, finally, uh, if you have any connection problems, uh, we hope that you won't, but it does uh, sometimes happen that uh, people have connection problems with the event. We have set up a couple of backup options for you. Uh, so we have both a live video option and a live audio option. Those are powered by YouTube and you can access them uh, through the, the links there that you see on your screen. Uh, we'll also, um, if needed, post those in the chat uh, throughout the event in case you're having trouble. Just let us know in the chat and we'll post those links again for you. Okay, so I think uh, with housekeeping out of the way, we can move on to the substance. Today, as you've heard, we're looking at the humanitarian financing landscape realities and emerging trends for NGOs. And uh, through the three presentations we're going to have today, uh, we have three experts coming from development initiatives, from OECD, and from World Vision. We're going to have an overview of the different traditional and emerging financing streams that are now coexisting in the humanitarian sector with a focus on how NGOs access humanitarian funding and the challenges that they currently face. The three presentations will be about 15 minutes each. Each, uh, and then those will be followed by a Q&A session of about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, then Melissa uh, will wrap up a few key points uh, and we'll have uh, just a few closing uh, remarks. Um, so now I'll hand it over to you, Melissa, to uh, introduce our learning objectives for the day. Thank you very much. We have five uh, learning objectives. Um, first, we want to improve knowledge of the overall size, composition, and flows of humanitarian financing. Um, second, we want to improve familiarity with the key traditional and emerging humanitarian financing streams, funding channels, and donors. Um, we also want to raise awareness about the main trends and opportunities affecting NGOs' access to humanitarian financing, uh, raise awareness about the main challenges and limitations that NGOs encounter in accessing humanitarian financing, and finally, um, improve familiarity with the different sources of information on humanitarian financing if you'd like to learn more. Okay, great. Um, so today, I, I did want to just highlight, because it's quite extraordinary, um, the number and variety of people we have joining today, um, I did want to highlight uh, the tremendous level of interest, for one thing, which I think is not surprising um, in this subject matter, um, but also uh, just the uh, the geographic diversity uh, and then also the diversity in terms of affiliations and professional experiences that you've seen uh, in the chat. The map in front of you there um, shows the, uh, the spread uh, globally of today's uh, participants coming from more than 100 countries. Um, for example, some of the most represented today, we have uh, Pakistan, the US, UK, Kenya, Belgium, Nigeria, Australia, just a, a remarkable uh, wealth of experience. So we do hope that uh, in addition to, um, uh, to learning from our, our guest speakers that you'll be able uh, also to, to learn and, and exchange with each other. Uh, okay, so back over to you, Melissa. 
Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. Uh, many of you may have heard them speak before. Um, the first will be Sophia Swithard. She is the Head of Research and Analysis at Development Initiatives. She also leads DI's work on crisis response and resilience, including authoring two annual global humanitarian assistance reports. And I have to say here that I really commend you to read these reports. They are a wealth of information. She's also been speaking and writing widely on humanitarian financing. Before joining DI, she worked for Oxfam, UNHCR, and the UK's Legal Aid Board. She's going to address the current state of play of humanitarian financing based on the latest Global Humanitarian Assistance Report, discussing the present flows of humanitarian aid, and trying to identify the key existing financing streams and the main recipients of humanitarian funding. Next, we're going to hear from Cyprian Fabre. He is a humanitarian policy analyst at the OECD. Before joining the OECD in 2016, he was heading the European Commission's ECHO Regional Office for West Africa, and he was first deployed for ECHO in 2003 as a technical assistant in various crisis locations. We've asked him to focus on the new trends that are emerging in the humanitarian financing system. He's going to briefly mention the implications that the grand bargain on humanitarian financing might have for NGOs' access to funding, and also focus on the emerging policies and tools aimed at improving funds efficiency and on new sources and approaches to funding. And last but not least, we have Julian Shordecki. He's the Technical Director of Humanitarian Grants at World Vision, where he has worked for over 17 years. In addition, he's participated in the setting up of British Overseas NGOs for Development, bonds effectiveness program and I have to say Julian is a very active member of not only the ICFA network but other um, NGO networks as well like SCHR and Interaction so we're very pleased to have him here today. He's going to give an NGO perspective on the whole issue of humanitarian financing by sharing his views on the main barriers that NGOs face when trying to access humanitarian funding and, and I see that some people have already written in asking for more detail on that so that's very helpful. Over to you Anharad. Okay, great. So thanks, Melissa, for, for all of the, uh, the introduction. Uh, we'll now be beginning with Sophia's presentation. So, uh, Sophia, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to ICFA and to PHAP for the opportunity to talk about this really important and highly topical issue. And thanks to so many of you from around the world for tuning in. It's really astonishing to see the, the turnout today. Really looking forward to hearing your questions and your insights and learning, particularly from your experiences. So I've been asked to uh, open this session and this learning series by giving you a, a quick guide, a, a kind of speed safari, if you will, through the landscape of humanitarian financing. And I hope you can all see the slides that I'm putting up here now. Um, the fact that this series is, is titled Demystifying Humanitarian Financing suggests that this landscape is a rather bewildering place to be, and I'm sure that's the experience of many of you. So I'm just going to focus to kick things off by, by looking at three big mysteries and trying to begin to unravel them a little bit for you. Uh, those three are firstly, what do we mean by humanitarian financing anyway? Secondly, how much is out there? And thirdly, who gives it to whom? Now, what I'm not going to try and do is to answer what I know is the biggest daily mystery for many of you, particularly the NGOs who are listening, which is how you can access it, access more of it in a way that better fits the needs that you're responding to. That's something that I'm sure will be touched on by Julian in his presentation and, of course, form, form the substance of many of the future sessions of this webinar series. So, with no further ado, let's try and unravel that mystery number one. What is humanitarian financing anyway? And just to inform this, um, I think there's going to be a short poll coming up. Yeah, that's just, hopefully you can see that now online uh, for you to, to respond to. Um, in your view, how should we be defining this term humanitarian financing? And you'll have some multiple choice options there. It'd be really interesting to see your views. It's by no means, as I'm about to explore a, a, a question with a fixed answer. So, so what are we talking about here when we talk about humanitarian financing? We might 
in shorthand, think that we all know what we mean when we talk about humanitarian financing. Um, the short answer is that it's it's just the money. It's the money that's given to respond to the urgent needs of people hit by humanitarian crises, and and by that, that's conflict and natural disasters. Simple, right? Well, actually, not so simple. And 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 in many ways, nor should it be, because we know that people's needs are often predictable usually protracted and always complex and changing and so should the financing be we all have heard and we all know that there's no one size so-called humanitarian financing definition or template that should cover the diversity of resourcing needs around different crises everything from the response to iraqi displacement to the sahel food crisis to the nepal earthquake the, the photo that you'll see in this cover slide is uh, two men, Albert and Bai, who were working for the Sierra Leonean Health Ministry to respond to the Ebola crisis, which is a really good example, actually, of the complexity of, of financing. You think Ebola, you think a large-scale, ra relatively rapid escalation crisis requiring emergency, life-saving response. You'd be forgiven in that context for thinking that it was resourced by what we know what we think of as humanitarian financing. But in fact, what we saw in that response was a very diverse resource landscape in which uh, what we would recognize as traditional humanitarian grants played quite a key role, but alongside all sorts of other streams uh, from crowdsourced direct giving, international health funds, development financing from global institutions, and of course national budgets in affected countries. And then even since the crisis, there's now talk and of, uh, well now under development, a regional risk financing insurance mechanism to respond to future health crises and epidemics. Um, the Ebola crisis is just one example. Um, and in many respects, what it demonstrates is, is great news. It's more awareness of the need for a sophisticated toolkit of financing responses for the different contexts, types, and phases of crises. And it's a toolkit that goes well beyond what we think of as traditional humanitarian grant giving. And I know this is something that Cyprian's going to cover in his presentation when he looks at um, everything from initiatives from the World Bank and the Islamic Development Bank to funding uh, for risk financing for, for floods and droughts in Africa. Well, that's the good news, is that there is this more sophisticated toolkit that goes beyond humanitarian financing that is emerging and is there. The less good news is, of course, it makes it much more difficult for, for you, um, many of you participating in this webinar, to navigate and to keep track of what's going on. Um, it matters to you as NGOs, particularly as you work both to advocate to ensure the right mix of tools are available to respond to the needs that you see, and as you work to proactively co-create the solutions and to hold donors to account for both the volume of resources and who can access them. So just as, as we start, I thought a quick uh, overview of the big picture. And I'm just going to show you a chart here that looks at the resource mix in just the 20 countries which receive the highest volumes of humanitarian financing. Now, you don't need to look at all of the detail here, um, but what you will see uh, are two things which I'd like to point out. Firstly, what's not in this chart, and this chart just shows the international resources. Um, just the international financing flows, and we mustn't forget about the importance of domestic resources, from refugee hosting to dealing with disasters. These are obviously critical. And secondly, I think the other thing that will stand out to you as you look at this is that of the international resources available in the countries uh, receiving the highest volumes of international humanitarian assistance, this grey pie, and let me just pull an arrow over to it so that you can see if I can. There we go. This dark grey piece of the pie, the human international humanitarian financing, actually only represents a pretty small proportion, 4.8%. Now you compare that to, for example, remittances, um, which are about 25%. ODA, about 
So it's just useful, I think, to remind ourselves before we zoom in on this grey part to be looking at it in the context of these wider resource flows, international and, of course, the domestic that you don't see here, and think about the interplay between them. Now, we are in this webinar going to focus in, or I'm going to focus in, in my presentation on this grey piece of the pie. Um, and to think about what we're talking about here, what makes it humanitarian financing? And the poll question that we asked was, um, what makes it humanitarian financing? Is it humanitarian because of which donor budgets it comes from? What kinds of agencies receive it? or the needs that it responds to. And if I can just quickly look at quite diverse answers here. Um, what most of you seem to be saying, just a quick box pop here, is that most of you think it should be defined by the activities it's spent on. Now, just going back to the, the presentation, um, we get our figures and the figures that inform this 4.8% from three main sources. We look at the international humanitarian assistance that's reported to the two big global humanitarian financing reporting systems. That's UNOCHA's financial tracking system and the OECD DAC. And great to have Cyprian on the call to be able to talk a little bit about that. And we're also adding into this figures that we get uh, for private financing that uh, delivery agencies, uh, including NGOs, UN agencies and the Red Cross, report to us as directed to humanitarian agencies. So let's, let's begin with a little bit of a working definition of what we mean by this grey pie. Um, and I'm just going to flash up on screen here. Let me just take that arrow away there. Um, and a definition that adapted from uh, the 2003 Good Humanitarian Principles. And broadly, this humanitarian financing, we're talking about financial resources for humanitarian action, i.e. to save lives, alleviate suffering, maintain dignity during and after crises, and to prevent and strengthen a preparedness for crises. And of course, a key factor in it, or a key defining factor, is that it's governed by humanitarian principles. Um, now, of course, we could have a webinar of all, all to discussing this definition, but let's stick with this as our, our working definition for, for the moment and for the purposes of looking at this, this segment of the resourcing pie. So zooming in on, on that 4.8% uh, that we were looking at there, what is happening to the volumes as we feel that maybe we're feeling at the front end that uh, crises are proliferating. We're certainly seeing numbers of displaced people, for example, around the world reaching a record high. Is the volume of humanitarian financing responding to that? Let me show you. So this comes on to mystery number two, how much is there? So let me show you a, a chart here which looks at the, what's happened to humanitarian financing between 2011 and 2015. So what you can see, again, let me get this arrow up here, is a year-on-year -year rise from 2012, 2013, 2014. 2014, it reached a record high. And then we put in 2015, we see another record high. So we're looking at 28 billion, the third consecutive rise and, and a record high. And you can see that that's made up of two parts. The orange bar there is funding from governments and EU institutions. The grey part is funding from private uh, donors for, for humanitarian, international humanitarian assistance. And you can see that both rose from 2014 to 2015. Now, that's a really useful thing to know in some respects, but in other respects, it's probably a fairly meaningless statement um, or make fairly meaningless data unless you think about was it enough? The critical question is was it enough? Well, although there was this, this increase in global generosity and we can start to put a figure on how much international humanitarian assistance 
there was, there isn't a clear answer to how much was needed. There's no global bill presented. However, we can get a little bit of a snapshot of, of requirements and needs from those that were represented in the UN coordinated appeals, which, as many of you know, bring together requirements from UN humanitarian agencies and many NGOs. So let me show you what happened there. The next slide. So while we see that there was a rise in international humanitarian assistance in, in total, when we zoom in and look at what happened to uh, funding against the requirements of the UN coordinated appeals, we actually see a shortfall. So what we can see from 2014 to 2015 is that needs or the requirements set out in those appeals actually dipped very slightly from 2014 to 2015. Uh, they were they reached about 19.8 billion in 2015. They currently stand at about 19.5 billion. But whilst the requirements dipped slightly by about 3%, we actually see that funding fell by a much greater proportion. And that fell funding levels fell by about 13%. And that meant that last year for the UN coordinated appeals alone, there was a 45% shortfall for the appeals. And that was the largest shortfall to date. And of course, this shortfall matters to you as NGOs, whether or not you participate directly in the appeals. And it plays out very differently in different contexts. We saw that, for example, Iraq, the appeal in Iraq was 74% funded last year, the appeal in Gambia, 5%. So moving on from that to look at the third mystery, which is related to, to this, the levels of funding, which is who gave all of this and to whom? Now, there's three sub-questions to look at here. Firstly, which donors give it? What kinds of crisis do they favour? And critically, thirdly, for this webinar series, to what kinds of organisation? So, looking first at who gives it? If we look at the funding from governments alone, or governments and um, multilateral uh, governments and the EU, I'm including within that, there's no big surprises as to who the big donors are. And there's another poll question just coming up to see what this looks like from your perspective. Given that we have participants from around the world, it'd be really interesting to see where most of you get your humanitarian financing from. Now, what this uh, chart shows you is that, as we would expect, no big surprises, a large proportion here. I'm just trying to get my arrow back. Um, here we go. Um, Excuse me. Um, there we go. Uh, we have a large proportion here from the US and from European donors. Um, many of you may be aware that the US is the, the largest donor provided almost a third of all funding from governments. And the big five, uh, the US, the UK, the EU, Germany and Sweden together provided about 60%. But what's also quite interesting here is not this fairly predictable uh, green and grey bar, but what's going on here in this purplish bar up here, this burgundy bar here. Uh, and this shows you the rise of funding from donors from the Middle East or the funding that's reported from donors from the Middle East. And we can see that this bar is continuing to rise quite significantly. Um, and it reached in 2015, we saw 2.4 billion in funding from the Middle Eastern donors, a rise in reported international humanitarian assistance of 500% since back here in 2011. And particularly notable are rises from uh, UAE, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Moving on to look at financing from private individuals, as, or from private uh, donors as opposed to government donors, what's 
also perhaps a challenging common perception is that we see that the majority of private financing actually comes from individuals. Now, there's an awful lot of focus, I think you'll assume, particularly around the World Humanitarian Summit, around the role of the private sector, a role of uh, the big trusts and foundations and philanthropy. But what we can see from our data set of about 290 is about uh, is that this huge percentage that comes from individuals. And when it comes to NGOs, we see that about 64% of humanitarian income, of private humanitarian income of NGOs in our data set actually came from individuals rather than from trusts and foundations or companies and corporations. And here we've got the national societies that contribute to uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent um, funding. Now, this leads us quite nicely on to the next question, which is what kinds of crises do these different funders favour? Because, of course, who gives it has quite big implications for who gets it. And we know that different donors, it's fairly obvious from our experience, intuition, that different donors favour different countries, different regions and different kinds of crisis. And just as an illustration of this, you can see the funding mixes in 2015. This just looks at data from the UN OCHA's financial tracking service to three different crises in that year, Yemen, Sudan and Nepal. And you can see, the, for example, here, this purple part, let me get the arrow again. Here we go, this purple part, the Middle East, Middle Eastern donors, quite dominant in Yemen, barely visible in Sudan, not contributing a huge amount in Nepal. When you look at Sudan, pretty much a split between European and uh, American donors. And then if you look at Nepal, this orange bar shows the dominance of the private sector. And this pretty much bears out what we, we see as a, a trend that what we see as Middle Eastern donors are tending to direct their funding to uh, crises in the Middle East region. Traditionally, private donors tend to focus on uh, disasters. So disasters caused by natural hazards, although Syria is proving a little bit of an exception to that. And of course, we would expect different donors to have different preferences. But of course, there isn't a global mechanism for all of these different donors to sit down together, uh, preempt crises together and have a division of labor to decide who's going to give to what. And the upshot of that can sometimes be that there's a uh, overemphasis on some crises and other crises fall by the wayside, fall through the cracks a little bit and you have forgotten crises. And of course, there's global balancing mechanisms uh, to try and respond to this, thinking particularly about some of the pooled funds. And I know that's going to be a focus of uh, a forthcoming webinar, so forgotten crisis window. Um, and um, when it comes to NGOs, the, for example, the, the exciting START Fund, which uh, aims to reach some of those places where, uh, in terms of rapid response and uh, the, the kinds and locations of crisis where the major donors can't reach or don't reach quickly enough. So moving on to the final question here, and this leads me to the final slide of my, my presentation, is to look at which kinds of organizations does it go to. Now this looks at the recipients, the first level recipients of financing, international humanitarian financing. What you can see here at the bottom, this green part of the circle looks at financing from governments, the top part of the circle, financing from private sector, and also from private, uh, private donors and private humanitarian assistance. And what you can see is that government donors give nearly two thirds of their financing 
to UN agencies. That's mostly, that's this part here, that's mostly UNHCR and WFP, but they, and they give about 17% of their financing directly to NGOs. Private donors, by contrast, give more to NGOs. They give about 86% of financing in the first instance to, to NGOs. But what's key in this is this inner circle and the fact that what this outer circle shows you is only the first level recipients. And in fact, as we know, as you know from your experience, it's only the first link in an often knotty transactional chain and the NGOs do indeed receive much more passed down through that chain um, or either from UN agencies or passed down from each other and to each other. Um, and this of course leads us into what I know is a preoccupation for many of you which is the traceability issue. It's often quite hard and it's currently quite hard to see from the available data exactly who receives what further down the chain and what the transaction costs involved in that are. And I think that's something that Julian might go on to look at. Um, there are a number of initiatives and solutions in play to try and uncover this and discover this better. And particularly the International um, Aid Transparency Initiative standard ultimately should help us to be able to look at uh, how money goes through the system. And all of this tra traceability question is key to the localization issue, which again, seeing from some of the questions that are coming through, is, is key to, to many of you in your daily work. And again, I think that's something that, that Julian's going to talk a little bit more about, because we know that at this level, this first recipient level, it's INGOs that tend to receive the lion's share of direct international humanitarian assistance. So international humanitarian agencies tend to have most access here, whilst local and national NGOs received, just looking at the OCHA FTS data, about 2.3% of funding to NGOs. And it's that 2.3%, that, that issue of how much international and local NGOs receive both directly here and indirectly that has prompted quite a lot of discussion and could be so bold to say a minor revolution around the World Humanitarian Summit and the commitments from the Grand Bargain and the Charter for Change initiative to pass on as much as possible, as directly as possible. Um, and discussions amongst many to come up with some kind of localization marker for being able to track that and, and hold those, uh, making those promises to account. So I will wrap up on that note and just um, hope that this very quick tool begins to give you the contours of the changing humanitarian financing landscape. Now, this uh, view of the humanitarian landscape perhaps can sometimes feel, I think, a little bit more like a, a mission to Mars rather than a, a tour through the park. Um, but in some, what we've seen are rising volumes, rising shortfalls, and rising, and I'd argue excitingly, rising complexity. Now, in terms of financial squeezes and in times of financial squeezes and global crises, these are enormously challenging times for you NGOs and those of you who are listening who are involved at the sharp end of humanitarian financing. But the exciting thing is that as NGOs, as um, people who are active in this humanitarian financing realm, both spending it, attracting it, and redefining it, you are being catalytic in rethinking and reinventing how we better resource response to crisis. And I'm looking forward to hearing from many of you your experiences in this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, before we move on to Cyprian's presentation, I just wanted to ask you one question. Given this issue of rising volume, but also rising shortfalls and uh, rising complexity. And we don't really have a localization tracker at the moment, um, and we have traceability issues. 
Do you still have a sense you could tell us um, the trends with regard to funding flows to NGOs? Do you do you think that the funding to NGOs has increased or decreased over the last years? And in particular, when we're looking at trends, uh, from which donors and sources do you think there have been major changes in the flow of aid towards NGOs? Yeah, th thank you. It's a very, very good question. Um, we have, just looking at the data from our combined data set over the last three years, as the global pot of international humanitarian assistance has increased, so has the volume to, uh, that, that goes directly to NGOs. So we've seen a rise, a year-on-year -year rise um, of the volumes going to directly to NGOs and I think we can also expect, although we haven't got visibility of the exact numbers, we can also expect that the corollary of that is that there is more funding going indirectly. So as both more funding goes directly to those INGOs um, and to NGOs as a whole, there's also more going to multilateral agencies and those multilateral agencies, those UN agencies, whether it's UNHCR or WFP, will be passing on more to NGOs as well who will be receiving it indirectly. Um, and we're seeing that actually the, the proportions, the, the volumes from private donors tends to stay around the same, fluctuate a little bit depending on the kinds of crises um, and that the funding directly from government donors uh, is uh, increasing and as more funding gets reported from DAC donors, sorry, from those donors that are outside the OECD DAC group, there is, we are seeing more funding from them as well, although proportionally they tend to favour UN organisations. Um, so the short answer is yes, a rise in volume. Um, and uh, one that I think that takes us through to 2015. Sorry, so the figures that we have for 2014, which is the uh, latest available complete data set. But I think we can probably safely say that that was a would be a trend that would have continued into 2015 as the global pot grew. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much, Sophie, and a uh, uh, brilliant presentation, and I can see um, very much appreciated um, by everyone uh, who's with us today. Uh, so thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to hear next from Cyprien Favre, uh, Humanitarian Policy Analyst, as you heard with the OECD. Um, Cyprien, over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, everyone. Um, this is really uh, great to be able to, to talk about uh, humanitarian financing uh, today. Um, so, as you know, all donors make decisions and, and choices about who, what, and where to fund in, in response to the crisis. But this landscape is changing fast, uh, as, as we've seen um, with, with Sofia, and, and um, I want to, to draw a short overview of, of those changes from uh, from the OECD perspective. Uh, maybe um, just as um, um, to start with some definition of what we are talking about, um, just to recall what the DAC is, uh, because you've heard uh, a lot about the DAC donors and, and what is the DAC is a Development uh, Assistance Committee, which is a group of 29 countries hosted by the OECD, uh, working on development cooperations um, broadly. Uh, it analyzes policies, measure funds, monitor funding, and give recommendations to its member. Uh, it is important to follow what the DAC is doing because even if we if we uh, if we talk about emerging trends and new donors, it still represents, uh, as we've just seen, the, the vast majority of public humanitarian money. So the, the big pot of money remains uh, here within DAC donors. Um, DAC donors give a humanitarian fund as what is called Official Development Assistance, or ODA. Uh, but as uh, Sophia just highlighted, the uh, humanitarian funding uh, represents only a small proportion of, of ODA. It's 4.8 percent. And you can see on this chart uh, uh, the light gray line at the bottom uh, compared, compared to, to, to wider development ODAs. 
dark gray. And, and uh, as Sophia mentioned, we should recall that ODA itself is only a share of, of all financial flows to, uh, to developing countries. Um, channel, Dark Donor Preferred Channel is a multilateral organization, clearly, uh, even if the NGO share is increasing. Um, direct support to government is rare, um, sometime after a natural disaster. But we see some changes here as well, um, mainly related to a migration crisis response, uh, where, where you have more direct support to affected uh, government. Pool fund uh, is an increasingly appealing feature for, for DAC donors, um, and we will talk about that later in Mr. Julian's presentation, probably. Non-DAC donors have different modalities. Non-DAC countries uh, can more easily support government, and charities or private donors resource to, uh, to NGOs or local responders more, more easily. Uh, however, we, we should know that UN agencies uh, have increased as well the share of their funds coming from, uh, from private uh, sector and from private uh, origin. Um, to, to bridge the global funding gap, um, and, and it's quite a wide gap, uh, some reflection and action are of course underway, and most notably the, the one bargain presented at the, at the World Humanitarian Summit uh, proposed a range of reform to, to use the resources more efficiently and, and more effectively. Uh, there is also a long-term aspiration to, to shrink the needs uh, through investment in risk reduction, in resilience building, in peace building even. Uh, but we can see uh, also a new division of labor which is possible. We have different actors uh, receiving funds to cover refugee costs and governments, for instance, like in Turkey. Um, we have funds for global health, so pandemic funds. Uh, and, and there is a possibility that the humanitarian sector uh, could be slowly brought back uh, to, to its uh, life-saving original mandates, uh, decreasing the scope of humanitarian. It's not a trend yet, but this is a, a possibility that we can, we can see. And, and finally, uh, increasing the funds means, of course, to, to, uh, to, to look for innovative funding, but, uh, but also to, uh, uh, to, to, to increase uh, the fund of, from DAC donors, keeping in mind the uh, 0 0.7 GNI target in mind. Um, and many don't know how are still not here yet. Uh, Cyprian, this is Melissa with ICFA. I uh, wanted to ask you two things. Um, first, do you mind speaking a little bit closer to your microphone so we could uh, hear you a little bit louder? Sure. And second, we got a question before the webinar. We received many questions before the webinar. And uh, Syed from Pakistan um, was asking, with regard to your point you just made on the, the funding gap, the funding gap is an issue. And if donors have limited resources and they have to prioritize where they uh, allocate those limited resources, um, could you say anything about that prioritization process? How do they prioritize, for example, um, when they're thinking about for the so-called forgotten crises. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, it's all about how, how donor makes a choice, actually, and, and, uh, and it's coming from where donor get the information, and, and most donor have the information about crisis uh, through their own early warning system or information system. Uh, it can be the embassy network or, or field network, if uh, is the case. But uh, uh, also, uh, they got information through UN appeal uh, and discussion with uh, UN agencies, for instance. And all, all that is, 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 uh, is giving a bonus to, uh, to media covered crisis or, or, or political crisis because it gets more in attention to, to this crisis. So I think that when it comes to forgotten crisis, uh, you have uh, you have an interest, of course, to, to forgotten crisis for many donors, but there is sometimes a lack of information about it. So I would certainly engage uh, NGOs or field actors to, to, to engage with donors at field and HQ level uh, to, feed, uh, to feed their donor counterparts uh, about information about the needs. Um, because if it's uh, below the radar, uh, donors will uh, will get more information from, from other sources and other uh, well well covered crises. So maybe uh, to to um, to come back to to 
some new modalities and new uh, architecture. Um, the short word about the Grand Bargain, which is, uh, as you know, an ambitious document uh, whose management is still being set with a steering group and probably a, a annual implementation report. But uh, even if it's not endorsed by all donors, it reflects well the, the state of the current policy discussion. And it addresses well the obstacle to more efficient humanitarian finance. So, uh, what does it change for NGO? Well, the bargain is a trade-off. Uh, so, donor gives better money, uh, not obviously more, but better money. And in exchange, humanitarian responders increase transparency, coordinate better, duplicate less. And better money, for instance, uh, if we talk uh, just an example about multi-year funding. Uh, you, you have uh, an increased multi year programming uh, from the donors, but you still have difficulties because, as you know, budgets and, and countries' budgets are, are revised on an annual basis. So even if there is a, a recognition of, of the need for, for better funding, uh, you have some legislative uh, constraints. Um, and even Besides that, there is a scope here for, for NGO to, to, to engage with, uh, with a donor counterpart. And also at field level, uh, because uh, you have some donor representatives who don't have the capacity to follow all the policy work around humanitarian funding. And it will be, uh, it's always interesting for them to, to be fed with, uh, with that. And it's also important to ensure that uh, when a donor follows the grant bargain provision, for instance, to going for multi-annual uh, multi funding, uh, it is reflected uh, uh, down the partnership line. It means that the secondary uh, partners uh, also benefit from, from those uh, improvements. So uh, it's again a question of, of engagement. Um, you have uh, more efficient funding which is required, and full funds are increasingly seen by donors as an efficient channel for that. You have a broad support for, for increase the self, for instance. Uh, you have new funds who are created, such as the uh, Education Cannot Wait. And you have a clear support to country-based pool funds or thematic pool funds. Uh, so far, you have uh, 18 country-based pool funds managed by, by OCHA, and, and this is to increase. Uh, the EU also is managing trust funds, uh, blending development, humanitarian, and, and migration-related programs. And those are accessible to NGOs. And there is a general recognition that NGOs, and including uh, local NGOs, should have better access to, to those funds. So here again, uh, NGOs should, should therefore ensure their access to pool fund. Uh, and it has to be made at policy level, of course, but, but the bank has to come from, from the country level. Uh, NGOs should make sure they participate individually or, or represent it to pool fund management board. It requires extra human resources, maybe, but if you are out of it, you won't be able to access the fund or to leverage the fund orientation. Uh, so it is quite in, a, an important feature. You, you have more crisis in middle-income countries, and, and middle-income countries are cash-based economies. Uh, yet, cash humanitarian programs remain a relatively marginal tool. But it, cross, uh, it cuts across all sectors, um, where the humanitarian system is built along sectors or, or silos. So cash is not easy to, to, to manage and to program. And large cash-based program is, is hugely transformative, and it can even represent a threat to, to the current humanitarian system. Because if, if people needs are, are met by multipurpose cash, uh, one can wonder why you have all those specialized agencies and NGOs. If banks are doing the transfers for cards, uh, what will the humanitarian organization will be, will be doing? Uh, is it just about identification and monitoring? So the sector needs a whole set of new skills and an investment to do cash programming at scale, uh, create links between banking, insurance, safety nets, uh, because NGOs have a role uh, and even a responsibility in preserving a humanitarian mandate uh, and looking for the most vulnerable in those, uh, in those uh, areas. And, and for instance, a very recent uh, ECHO uh, social safety net project, uh, up to, to 3, 350 million euros, which is a massive cash program in Turkey, which has uh, been announced recently, uh, will be certainly an important step in, in that direction. We, we need to follow that. Localization, um, all, donor, all know that most of the aid is delivered through national partners, and, and, and they know that they are often poorly served in terms of financing. But for the now, there are several difficulties to engage directly with local uh, with local uh, partners. Uh, most donors don't have 
capacity uh, as simply as, as they have low capacity to administrate grants and they will prefer one large grant, a uh, number like grants, to someone partnering with local partner. It makes one grant, one reporting line, it's, it's, it's easier. In some context as well, uh, with not, not too many people on the ground, donors don't know uh, who are the local or national uh, responder. How do they abide by standard financial or security regulation and, and even how can they be paid with it? So you have risk for anyone to, to, to give money to someone you don't know. And if you need money from someone, you need to be known and trusted or to give guarantees. And uh, I think that creation of, of networks of, such as a near network should, should be the basis for an administrative quality control. Uh, and partner capacity assessment, as we see, is something to increase and harmonize. It's, uh, it has to be harmonized because it's a burden on, on NGOs, but it's all about risk and, and capacity. There is a real momentum uh, on, uh, on, on localization of the aid, and NGOs should understand that the obstacles for donor are more technical uh, than principles, and, and there is a space to propose a reference partner capacity assessment and, and risk management. This is, this is something to, uh, to, to work at. This was just a few points on, on the increased efficiency part of the deal, but you have other points to, to increase funding and, and the track to be explored to increase funds are not that many and not, uh, are not all are easy for, for, for NGOs, but let's see that rapidly. Uh, private funds, uh, Sophia talked about it and, and, and it represents a, a one quarter of the uh, overall international humanitarian assistance. Uh, but if you factor in non-financial contributions, such as both personnel and expertise, this will bring this total much higher. And this private support is very broad in its form. It can be individual donation, and, and, and it, has been, uh, it has been presented already that, that majority of 64% uh, is coming from private uh, donation, and those are increasing in emerging, in emerging economies. Local actors can raise private funds in their, in their countries, and is the case already in the Middle East or in India. Remittance are a form of private funding, and probably the most direct one. It's complex to, to, to measure, but, but some local NGO could pull remittance in some occasion. You have funds and, and charities. We, we all know some of them, such as the Bill and the Bill Gate, but, but you have many banks and companies who have foundation and charity. And you have companies' technical assistance, and, and corporate partnership goes beyond money, uh, and a partnership with private sector, it fosters innovation, whether it's banking, telecommunication, uh, data management, IT. Uh, and, and the World Summit in Istanbul presented a, a broad range of private actors engaged into, uh, into a crisis uh, response and, and proposing innovative solutions. So NGO could and should approach those private donors, uh, but it requires a different approach. You, you don't raise funds the same way to uh, IKEA Foundation or, or to Defeat, for instance. Uh, and it requires to be, prepared, to, to be prepared to have their own network and have in mind what can the NGO can offer to, to, to those funds, to those uh, uh, companies. Uh, companies have better technical expertise, but NGO can offer market opportunities, testing new products under certain conditions, expanding experience or only feasibility. We've seen also already with Sofia uh, the increased role played by the Gulf states in some areas of the world uh, as a donor and, and, and how structured they are working at day. But the second element is the uh, Islamic social finance, and, and this is really an underexplored opportunity in the humanitarian sector. Uh, there is a, a great potential contribution of the Islamic social finance to, to, support, uh, to support humanitarian aid, and this is where probably NGO network can, can have a better access and build partnership. But does this require investing in the understanding of economic finance and the risk funding mechanism? Uh, for instance, you, you have already some partnerships, the Malaysian Bank, May Bank, and uh, the Norwegian Refugee Agency uh, have already announced uh, a global humanitarian uh, endowment fund, the WACF, to, to provide uh, stronger support to humanitarian response. You have the Central Bank of Indonesia, for instance, working at setting standards for Islamic social finance. To, to, to collaboration with the Islamic Development Bank. So you have some, some avenue uh, to, uh, to, to explore in, uh, in, uh, in, in that field as well. But maybe one of the, uh, uh, one of the, the growing potential aspects is the risk financing. Uh, 
for, for Global Humanitarian Funding. And it's a key area because it, it cuts across cash-based response, social safety net, disaster preparedness, and, and it links with the private sector. Uh, it's a policy area of increased interest as well for, for development and humanitarian donors. Uh, we are testing, for instance, forecast-based financing with, uh, with the IFRC, notably, uh, and within the global framework of climate change financing. But it is it's rather outside the NGO traditional water screen. Uh, NGO should try to understand better what it is about and understand the stakes and the possible role, uh, because it can bring new partnership and, and certainly uh, it can have uh, it can bring some new programming approaches uh, at, between development and, and uh, response crisis. What is it about? Very shortly, it involves the retention of risk combined with the adoption of a plan to, to, to ensure that funds are available uh, when, a disaster, when a disaster occurs. Uh, it, it's, it can be established by government themselves using their own reserve or uh, obtained externally through credit facilities. So it's about transferring, shifting the risk to, to others. Uh, in exchange for a premium, uh, they provide compensation uh, when, when there is a disaster. Uh, it can be obtained through insurance policies, capital market instruments such as a catastrophe bond. And you have several examples, and not new. Mexico, for instance, started to, to, to work on that in, the, in 1996. Um, so this is all interesting, but what does it uh, have to do with, uh, with the NGOs. Uh, risk financing is characterized by a shift from a reactive to a preventive uh, mobilization of, of funds. So it's interesting because it, it comprises notably risk assessment, risk prediction, prevention, uh, and mitigation measure. Uh, it comprises emergency preparedness, uh, including financial preparedness, uh, and payout distribution in terms of disaster. So all that are fields where NGOs are already active. So supporting the development of the risk transfer market uh, can benefit NGOs, uh, because in some instances, risk insurance can target service providers, uh, such as micro insurance providers, organizations who assist their members to manage risk, cooperative union, NGOs, and, and self-help group, and we've seen that in IT, for instance. And this is really where NGOs can have leverage partnering with government and private sector. And, and, and it's linked with social protection or social safety nets, uh, which are increasingly recognized as a key instrument in protecting individuals uh, against shocks. Uh, and the social safety net agenda is really linked with risk financing. And this is also a domain in which many NGOs are already involved. So there is a lot to learn in, in that field. Um, that was really a, a short overview, but in, in conclusion, um, in conclusion, we, we can. Uh, uh, we can say that the world is not getting easier for, for NGOs. Um, and and, and uh, donors have less capacity, uh, sometimes less fee capacity. Uh, traditional donors are, are caught between sometimes contradictory requirements, such as support to local actors, but at the same time decreased administrative burden. Uh, Non-traditional donors are not yet completely easily accessible, uh, and private donors are not organized or, or, or structured. Uh, so it's not the time to, to be alone uh, or to be small uh, for NGOs. And NGOs have to, to offer new delivery mechanisms, for instance, either through a niche approach or specialization, so that the NGO has clearly defined added value to any donor, uh, whether it's technical, such as demanding, or, or even non-technical delivery mechanisms, such as a cash-based response. And also very important, I think, is to be part of a wider network uh, that can interact at policy level uh, and where known trusted, and where NGO can leverage uh, even above their individual capacity, and, and then they can access better funds, or including pool funds. Um, so there is a lot to, uh, to, to do. The world is not, not getting uh, easier, but you can see uh, that you have some new avenue, new ways of, of, of reflection. And, uh, and we see we see the poll, uh, which has been uh, launched, where, whereby uh, you believe that cash based response is, uh, is is one with the greatest potential, and it's true because uh, cash based response is uh, is really the most transformative. Uh, it links with all the other trends uh, and, and including risk financing, uh, but it's transformative and it requires a 
specific. It's not um, it's not only about a, a supra voucher uh, cash based response at scale. Uh, it, it's really uh, changing the humanitarian landscape. So uh, with that, I, I leave you for for the question after. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cyprien, for your presentation and, and also for uh, for your comments on the poll. It was really interesting um, to see after we had spoken, uh, uh, heard from you about some emerging trends, uh, then to see which ones are foremost uh, on the mind of our participants. So uh, thanks so much uh, for the presentation and also your, your reflections uh, at the end. So we'll now be moving to our final presentation today uh, by Julien coming to us from World Vision, uh, the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Um, yes, loud and clear. Excellent, okay thank you. I'll just wait for a moment for the presentation to load. So building on Sophia and Cyprian's comments, this is this is this is hopefully an attempt to talk about what does all of this mean for for NGOs. So I'm just waiting to um, presentation to come up. I've got the little grey spinny wheelie thing here at the moment. Um, so what we'll do during the during the time that we that I'm presenting is I'm going to discuss some of the barriers for uh, NGOs accessing funding. Now we've got a very diverse group of people on the call, so this will be this will be we'll be sticking to some basics. But there's some UN people, there's people from my NGOs, people from local NGOs. I'll also provide an update on what's being done about them. And do feel free to chip in in the chat box if you think that there's anything I'm missing out about addressing that barrier, as it will just enrich the, the value of the presentation for others. And then we also have a slide of links where we can talk about later, okay, which we'll share with you later. So I'm going to share just five or six barriers and what, the, what we're currently doing about them as an international community. So the first barrier you may have come across in accessing funding is a very practical one, which is that donors may require grant applications to be made via a headquarters capital. So some donors will require you to deal with the headquarters in their home country. So for example, the German foreign ministry, the Canadian government, they can be like that. And this is often due to the fact that they don't have the staff and the capability to engage with the field because of overhead issues in headquarters. Another issue is that some donors may require a pre-qualification in their home country. So, for example, if you want to apply for ECHO funding, you either need to have a framework partnership agreement yourself, which is, which, which is where a European member state registered NGO or a Swiss NGO has a special pre-qualification with ECHO, or you may need a partner that's got that. Another one is that there's a number of bilateral grant schemes out there that all have different rules and regulations. So, for example, DFID, USAID, ECHO, the Norwegians, etc. And all of these have different rules and regulations, which can become a major um, drain on your time and resources to, to uh, manage. So what we're doing about that to reduce barriers as a, as, a, as a community, there's increased use of pool funds. So, for example, Cyprian talked about them working in 18 countries. There was 591 million in OCHA, UN OCHA based country based pool funds last year. Um, there are also as some donors are sharing pre qualifications. So, for example, the Dutch government and the Finnish government use the ECHO framework partnership agreement as a summary and um, as a pre qualification for their schemes as well. And then also there's a growth of INGO partnering where an INGO in a donor headquarters country partners with field based NGOs. So if you want to access some of these funds, sometimes the best thing to do is to partner with, with an INGO that, that does that. Another really realistic barrier here is that reporting can be a challenge. So you may feel like this guy here with a massive bulging in tray of narrative reports you have to do. And this can be a big burden when every donor requires a different report in a different format at a different time. Um, some people have also questioned whether this favors those who can do the paperwork over those who can do the implementation. And then also, there's a question of do donors actually pay the true cost of reporting? So some of the practical things that are happening to hopefully reduce this burden and shrink it like the picture has on the page. So a coalition of NGOs, including ICFA, have led the way on a less paper, more aid initiative. This is really exciting in that it um, looks at the timing of reporting, the diversity of formats, and if there are alternatives to reducing the number of narrative reports that you have to write. And um, 
So you can actually get more when you get the presentation by clicking on the link, clicking on the link in the PowerPoint presentation. The grand bargain, which Cyprian talked about earlier, has a has a commitment to harmonize and simplify reporting by 2018. Now, that's going to be quite an upward journey, but there's at least donors are talking about that because the grand bargain has the 15 largest donors and all the large UN agencies coming together around an agreed work plan. And then also there are opportunities with um, new technology. So the grand bargain commits to invest in technology to improve reporting. And a simple example of that is World Vision has a last mile mobile solution, which is a cash card you can be read, your beneficiaries can be registered to. And then it automatically combines all of your data and saves a lot on reporting um, uh, costs and overheads and things like that. And this is a system that's been used by multiple INGOs, such as Oxfam, uh, NRC, uh, the Red Cross as well. So anyway, that's not, not to publicize our own thing. It's just an example of how new technology can change things away from having to write so many narrative reports. Another barrier can be the complexity of the UN system. You may sometimes feel like you're at the funding equivalent of you turned up at a traffic junction and you see some traffic lights or robots that look like that. And so some complexities there can be things like um, language, so everything's in English, whether that's the language of the country or not. The reform agenda requires us to coordinate through the cluster system, which is good, but which brings its complexities. And often there are international players that can work that better than local actors. And then also there's a plethora or a, or a range of different pooled funds that can be quite confusing. So, what's, so what are we doing about that to reduce the complexity of the system or at least help people to navigate that and know which traffic light they should be looking at as they cross the junction? Well, the NGOs and networks that engage with the UN on the Interagency Standing Committee's um, Humanitarian Finance Task Team. This is, a, this, is, this is something that Melissa, who's on the call, co-chairs with somebody from the UN. And it's where we work on issues of mutual interest to make the system better for everybody. It's the only global forum where NGOs in the UN get together to talk about funding issues systematically. And um, all are welcome to engage with Melissa and ICFA on that. Um, another key one is NGOs uh, are also on the pooled fund working group. So Oxfam, uh, World Vision, and the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations work on that. Uh, ben Garbutt from Oxfam represents that, and I can paste you his email address. Basically, uh, uh, every, in November, there's a, there's, they have their, their meeting where you can talk and ask questions about pooled funds. There are a, there are a range of um, – oh, Ben's online. Great. So, Ben, if you want to put in your the best way to contact you about that, that would be great. And um, there are a range of in-person and call-in options uh, for that. If you want to know more about that, Ben's put his email address in the chat box. So that's brilliant. And that, another thing also is the growth in online courses to, uh, to understand the UN. There are upcoming seminars in this series which will help you with that. And there are other people too, like building a better response. At the end of this presentation, there's a slide of links you can go to to look at some of this stuff. Okay, another barrier is risk assessments. Now, risk is an interesting thing. I'm fairly sure that this picture is photoshopped. And um, but about financial risk, counterterrorism, capacity assessments, etc. And some of the things that have been done about that. If you're working in a fragile state, this will be a big part of your world, I'm sure. In the grand bargain, UNICEF, UNHCR, and WFP have committed to harmonize and simplify their partnering arrangements. So they're looking at having a single capacity assessment. This is a massive thing. So you'll only have to do one exercise to be eligible for UN funds, which is really good. And um, that's great. Terrorism remains a really difficult discussion on how you handle all the counter-terrorism stuff. But NRC have done some leading work on that, and I can post a, um, a link to that later. Uh, but that, that is something that I think particularly some of the major donors, so the Europeans and the Americans, are really wrestling with how best to do that. So, so there, there are some really key things uh, there. Another challenge also is the speed of access to funding. So you may feel once you've submitted your proposal, you're at the traffic lights again, and this light never turns green because you just have to wait for a very long time. So, for example, OCHA targets 52 days for disbursement. 
Um, I know sometimes they can be quicker, and um, there are some extra people on the call. So uh, if you've got any comments about that, do make that in the chat box. There is a commitment to try and do that quicker. And some bilateral donors can also take weeks or months as well. So anyway, in terms of the improvements, there are rapid response budget lines from some of the major bilateral donors, so DFID, ECHO. They have, they have budget lines which can distribute funding a lot quicker, but these do tend to require a pre-qualification or a level of experience with the donor. Um, there also is the emergence of non-UN pooled funds, so the START fund can distribute funding in seven days or less, and um, that's done based on a local discussion, usually. Um, and there's links at the end of the presentation about how you can learn more about the START fund. Um, also, you can use crisis modifiers in development programs. So that's where you have a pre-agreed um, set of conditions with your donor where you can redirect your development funding when a disaster happens. So a good example of that is Save the Children have um, in Yemen. They've done some leading work with DFID where data can trigger changing some of their government grants. And that can be, and in World Vision, we have a rule where up to 20% of our sponsorship development funds can be redirected in the event of certain criteria being met. The Pooled Fund Working Group, I should also mention, has been working on uh, pop-up versions of the OCHA Pooled Funds, which should, which should emerge quicker and distrib distribute quicker. So, okay. Another major issue for NGOs is covering the cost of the capacity building. So this is about how do you fund the cost of your organization and how do you um, and do the donors pay for that, which is always something that NGOs do like to talk about. So ways in which we're working on closing the, um, uh, the capacity building gap and funding that, the grand bargain which Cyprian referred to earlier makes a commitment that donors will increase and support investment in the institutional capacity of local and national responders. This is a great thing. It's also supported by other things in the grand bargain, such as a commitment to multi-year funding. If you've got a commitment to multi-year funding in your conflict or, or emergency context, it makes it easier to retain your staff because you don't have those difficult breaks in funding, where, which either mean that you can't pay your staff or it encourages your staff when they're worried about that to go look for other positions. Um, some other practical things around that, OCHA are piloting multi-year planning in the countries you can see on the slide. And um, also, uh, you've got the core humanitarian standard is also pretty good as well, in that that provides a description of capacity in line with regular quality assurance uh, principles from other sectors. It doesn't look at the, your project, it looks at the organization behind the project. So it provides a standard around what a good organization should look like. You know, so it's about things like M&E, how good is your human resources function, et cetera, and it provides a justification for that. Also, some of you may have heard of the Charter for Change, and that commits signatories to support capacity building and protect local organizations from staff poaching. So um, this, is, this is something that's been driven particularly by Christian Aid by uh, CAFOD, but also CARE, Islamic Relief, Oxfam, Tear Fund, and others are all signatories to that. And that's quite exciting because it, it is an attempt by the INGOs to develop a better way to work with their local partners. Um, I see Gareth from CARE is also typing something, so as somebody who's committed to the Charter for Change, his comments in the window might be interesting. So we're running a bit behind time. so. This is, this is where I'll wrap the presentation up. I'll just trailer very briefly. There's an, we do have a poll that's coming out here now about which do you think is the biggest barrier to you and your organization. So do feel free to click on that. And um, shortly, we'll also share a slide which has got a list of handy links um, about, uh, about where you can go for more information on some of this stuff. Yeah, so if I could just jump in. So while we're running that um, poll to see uh, what are some of the challenges um, that all of our participants are, are facing in their, their work, um, building on your presentation, uh, maybe you can uh, just walk us through quickly the, um, the resources I know you had to share. Um, and then by the time you're done with that, I think we'll have the results on the poll. So if you have comments on the poll, then at the very end, it would be great to, to hear your thoughts. Sure, absolutely. So. 
So where, in terms of where to go for more information, uh, if you look there, we've got links on, uh, you can sign up for the other seminars in this series. There's four or five of those. Uh, additionally, um, you can see on the slide there, ICF, the ICFA network with Melissa does an excellent job in terms of summarizing updates on what's going on in humanitarian financing. Building a better response aims to build the capacity of all aid workers uh, on uh, in the international coordination mechanism. The IASC Humanitarian Financing Task Team has uh, a website too, which contains some useful information. All NGOs are welcome to come to the, the task team, but in practice, it can be really difficult for people to make that. So using your network, such as ICFA, really makes a lot of sense. There's also a link to the Grand Bargain document. I really like the Grand Bargain because it's got 10 commitment areas and it's a kind of summary of what the major issues are that the donors and the UN want to work on at the moment. So that's well worth a read and that's a relatively short document to get an idea of where the donors are moving. And then there also are links there to uh, Less Paper, More Aid, uh, the Core Humanitarian Standard, Charter for Change, Disaster Ready, the Humanitarian Leadership Academy as well has got some useful stuff. And also there's a link to uh, World Vision's um, LMMS system. So that's, hello? Yeah, sorry, we're, I'm not sure what that noise is, but um, I'll come that's in. That's my alarm to oh. say it's time to stop your presentation. <laughs> well, perfect uh, timing then, Julian. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. we love it. Um, so thanks so much for your presentation. Um, excellent. And uh, we're now, as everyone can see, we are running a little bit um, behind schedule. There's just been so much um, fantastic content to uh, go through. Um, so we are going to be extending the, um, the session by a little Bit. I'll just quickly run through the plan here. We're going to um, have uh, now some time for a Q&A that will be moderated by Melissa, who has uh, a number of excellent questions that have come in um, from all of you during the session, so she'll pose those to our speakers. Um, then she will offer a few um, closing uh, thoughts, some uh, um, summary points uh, herself, and then we'll turn um, back uh, for finally very brief remarks um, at 10 past the hour um, to our, our three panelists. Um, then um, the uh, panel uh, discussion and Q&A will be over and we'll move on to some uh, information for all of you about upcoming um, events. We'll provide a, a bit more of a description of those. So now over to you, Melissa, for the Q&A. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you who have submitted questions before the webinar and also during the webinar. Um, we're clearly seeing a lot of interest in the issue of localization and uh, getting smaller NGOs in different regions better access to funding. So my first question will be directed to Sophia. It's a two-parter. James from Kenya has said it's very challenging for small NGOs to access financing. And you even mentioned it, Sophia, in your presentation that direct funding for national NGOs is 2.3%. Um, so that is an issue. And we've heard about the Charter for Change, which has a target of 20% direct funding. And the Grand Bargain even takes it further to 25% uh, with the caveat uh, as directly as possible. Um, so James from Kenya was saying, is there any advice that you have for smaller NGOs to get access to that financing, um, to reduce the barriers, but also get more direct financing. And Mary from Iraq has added uh, one of the challenges she noticed is that some of the um, national NGOs, they have really great capacity, but they don't speak the language, um, the language that is required to fill out grant applications. And she was wondering, for example, if we're thinking of ways to um, give advice or think of things to help improve NGO access, one could be about reducing the language barrier. So I wonder, Sophia, if you have any advice for um, this whole issue of improving um, NGO access to funding, especially for the smaller um, NGOs. Over to you, Sophia. Great, thank you very much, and thank you for passing this, this question to me, although I think that possibly Julian may be also be in a very good position to, to answer this question. Um, 
I think now is the moment where change is really starting to happen and there's a real appetite to hear these experiences at, at the sharp end from local and, and national NGOs. Um, I think both the Charter for Change, the localization tracking that's coming or is in development after the Grand Bargain discussions and the development of the, the NEAR network, the network of sovereign NGOs, provide the perfect opportunities um, and channels for the voices and experiences of local and national NGOs to be heard as, as really never before. And what was really encouraging was to see how what happened in the World Humanitarian Summit, the fact that it was uh, not an intergovernmental process, the fact that it was a all voices event meant that the voices of local and national NGOs were allowed to be heard in the system in, in a way that, that really hasn't, hasn't historically happened, I don't feel, before. So um, in terms of the practical advice, um, I would put, defer you to, to Julian on that, but I would say do continue to feed into the fora that he mentions, do continue to feed your experience, your recommendations um, and your uh, advocacy advice into uh, both those larger institutions that are um, following the the grand bargain commitments um, to the near network and to ICFA and I think as I say as now and never before I think there, there is an appetite to hear and to act on them Thank you, Sophia. I will um, ask Julian to see if he has anything to say on that. And I also wanted to ask Julian, because you mentioned, Julian, that you love the Graham Bargain, and you're also part of uh, the expanded group of uh, World Vision has signed on to the Grand Bargain. Um, Angelina from the UK is asking, um, what do you see as the real um, outputs of the Grand Bargain discussion, um, how will it be operationalized, and how do you see these changes making an impact for the humanitarian community? So it's up to you, Julianne, if you want to take that first or if you want to um, follow on to the question about um, NGO access. Julian, just a quick note. Uh, you need to reconnect your audio. Click the phone symbol on top of your screen. Hello, am I, am I back now? Yep, sounds good. Yes. Excellent, okay, um, thank you. In terms of the localization piece, I'll start with that and then just go on briefly to the grand bargain. There is a localization marker that's being developed, which uh, the Red Cross with Jamila Mahmoud and, um, and AJ and the Red Cross have been working on and also uh, Anne Street's taking up uh, the, the development of the localization marker. I'll give you Anne's contact details briefly in a moment. Um, and that looks at the quality of funding that's going to um, local organizations via intermediaries. I think on a, on a personal note, on the localization issue, the amount of money that goes directly to local NGOs is a bit of a, it's a, bit of a uh, smoke screen. It's not really the key issue. The key issue is what kind of intermediaries do you have? between the main donors and the uh, local organization and the final implementer and how can we make that transaction as as good as possible so for example I know the Canadians the Germans as I said in my PowerPoint presentation they don't want to give money directly to smaller local organizations because of capacity constraints on their side so the quality of the intermediaries is a really productive thing to focus on and so with that, there's a lot of things in the grand bargain around increased transparency of transaction chains and the things like the single capacity assessment from multiple UN organizations that really are going to make a big difference to people who are trying to access funding from pool funds at the local level. Also, the START fund becomes a useful example as well because it's geared, geared particularly around the needs of smaller local organizations in smaller emergencies. And so these things all come together. And for the grand bargain itself, I mean, some of this stuff is for the UN, to be honest, if you look at the 10 commitment areas, but has indirect benefits for us. So things like increased uh, efficiency within the UN, better cost structures, those kinds of things. Um, but there are some very practical things for NGOs that are implementing on the ground. Things like uh, 
when you look at a commitment for multi-year funding, which OCH is already rolling out to the seven or eight countries I mentioned in my presentation, things like a more explicit commitment to capacity building of local organizations is another major win. It also gives a shot in the arm to the less paper, more aid work that uh, Melissa and others at ICFA are really leading on behalf of the sector. So it's something that does have the potential to deliver some very real benefits for um, for implementing organizations. And one other thing I would say about that is, is in the grand bargain itself, although it's an agreement between the 15 largest donors and the UN agencies, we've had three NGO networks at the table, Interaction, SCHR, and ICFA. And at all of those times, each one of those agencies has been thinking about the good of all NGOs of all types and all sizes. So it hasn't been a case that you've had the big organizations sitting around the table with the donors and the UN to basically set up something that's good for us. There's always been this look at what does the NGO sector as a whole need? And um, I think I can say this because I don't work for ICFA, but I think we've been very lucky to have ICFA leading the charge for this op for us and for the whole NGO community as a whole. Thank you so much, Julian. That was, I did not pay you to say that, but I really appreciate that. Um, now I'd like to go to Cyprian. We have a question from Gohar in Pakistan, and it ties very nicely to your presentation because you talked about pooled funds and you talked about um, the emphasis, for example, in the World Humanitarian Summit on um, doubling to one billion the Central Emergency Response Fund, the SURF. And Gohar asks if NGOs, especially local NGOs, can access funds from the SURF. And if not, um, could this be a possibility in the future? Would you like to take that question, Cyprian? Uh, yes, so um, do you hear me well? Because I, I, I know uh, I had some problem at the beginning. I'm sorry for that. We hear you, but it could help if you speak a little bit louder. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, okay, so on, on the pool fund, um, as you know, the, the SEF is not aimed to be accessible by by NGOs. Uh, however, um, with a trend for more and more uh, resort from donors to pool funds, with more pool funds or trust funds being established uh, here and there, um, the question of uh, direct access uh, to pool funds by NGO uh, is raised right, and some uh, some discussion are even um, being uh, established to to, uh, to make sure that NGO are part of the uh, um, of the board of some of the trust fund and and some discussion about a specific pool fund for for uh, NGOs also are on the table. So it, it's it's all of a new set of of things because uh, as has been uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Julian and Sophia before. Uh, there is a momentum on, uh, on the local localization, and, and uh, we don't have a marker yet. We're working on it, um, but there is a momentum. Uh, so it, it will come not from the SEF probably, uh, but certainly from uh, from other sources or, or pools. From but again, as I said, uh, as I said before, um, NGOs and even local NGOs have a responsibility to make sure they are on this train, and um, and for that. Um, and for that, uh, you need to be strong and, and to be heard. So you need to be together, and uh, and a network. Um, a network here is, is a key issue for for that. So uh, we talked about the near network, but you can have some country-based network to to make sure that local NGOs are well represented. Uh, and and uh, what I wanted to say also is that usually the laws are, are not uh, avoiding changes, and uh, they're happy to do so, but they are uh, avoiding risk and they have to do things uh, within their capacity. Um, so donors are not a monolithic entity. Uh, it's not because you talk to, uh, to, to, to someone uh, that you talk to the donor in itself. So you need, it, it needs a strategy and it requires NGO to have a, uh, yeah, a strategy and, and then to have a common strategy. Um, so the advice here would be to, uh, to, to get together to, to be sure that uh, that pool funds at country level are accessible to uh, to NGOs, 
and, and uh, uh, that risk are being uh, assessed together with uh, with donor. And, and I fully agree with uh, Julian's comment. Um, it's not uh, it's not tomorrow that you will have uh, uh, a lot of direct funding. Uh, most uh, the most uh, likely scenario is that you will have uh, still some. Um, uh, intermediary um, and the quality of this intermediary is, is, is key for that. Thank you, Cyprian. Uh, now I'd like to go back to Sophia and combine two questions that we received. Um, it's, it's the question that we received are mostly trying to better understand um, particular donors and where their funding ultimately goes. So Tiambi from Malawi um, noticed in the poll that a lot of the participants here have received funding from the EU, uh, from European donors, um, the US is a very large donor, and um, Tiambi was wondering where do those funds go? And Jeffrey added, um, he noticed in the pr presentation that there is a, a large amount of increase in funding from um, the Middle East, and he's wondering, uh, from, for example, from Middle Eastern donors, are those donors more interested in focusing on those their region, or are they looking at a wider range of humanitarian crises around the world? So I wonder, um, Sophia, if you could just comment on um, those three donors, where you find their funding flowing over. Sure, thank you very much. And I guess the where it flows, there's two parts to that. Where does it flow geographically and to which kinds of agencies does it flow? Now, where it flows geographically, um, we do see a significant concentration of international humanitarian assistance. Um, if we look at, and this is analysis that we have in the GHA report, which I think um, has been shared, the link has been shared with um, participants and we can uh, also put up on online. Um, but what we see um, year on year and, and increasingly is a trend of concentration to a few mega crises. Now, um, in particular, that's to Syria, but also to a number of other major crises. Um, if we look just at the funding that's reported to UN OCHA's uh, financial tracking service, we saw that um, the response in Syria uh, accounted for, let me just look at, look at the figures here, about a third went to Syria of the, in, of the total international humanitarian financing um, in 2015. When I say Syria, that's the wider Syria crisis, so Syria around the region, and about a half to the top five crises. So that is a, an increasing concentration to, to, the, to the mega crises, um, certainly compared to the, the picture in, in 2012. Um, so that's uh, that's one thing uh, very much to to note and, and fits in a little bit with the discussion that we were having previously on forgotten crises, which are the corollary, obviously, of uh, the mega crises and um, the the concentration of funding to to a, a small small number, or proportionally small number of, of crises. Um, and then, of course, there's the question uh, of looking geographically the question you asked about Gulf donors, as I showed in my presentation, primarily funding from Middle Eastern donors goes to the region, although there are, of course, instances um, where it does flow outside. Um, and then the, the other question of to whom does it go, what kinds of agencies, again, as I started to cover in my presentation, um, it really does depend on which kind of uh, donor you are talking about um, and to which kind of crisis, but we do see that uh, both for donors uh, from within the DAC group and donors from without the, from outside the DAC group, including the Middle Eastern donors, the primarily their fund, the bulk of their funding flows in the first instance to uh, multilateral agencies, including UN agencies of those UNHCR and WFP are the largest recipients, and then second to 
NGOs, um, and then that picture is reversed when we talk about private financing. I hope that begins to answer your question, and as I say, there's a lot more detail on all of those within our reports. If you'd like to uh, have a look at those and to follow up with any other questions, do me on those directly. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, we have time for one more question, and I'll give this one to Julian. It comes from Rosie in Belgium, and it's very relevant to several of the questions that we've received that we don't have time to go into in depth. Um, she's asking about uh, the differences, alliances, and conference of interest between national NGOs and large international NGOs accessing funding. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about that um, relationship? It's come out a lot in discussions this year about complementarity, and, uh, and I think that you might have some perspective on that. So over to you, Julian. Um, hi, yeah, thanks, Melissa. I think, I think the issue hinges in some ways on what's a local NGO and what's an INGO. And to begin with, that sounds quite simple. But I, I flag that in Sophia's GHJ report, they actually have five or six different categories because when we talk about what's, what's diverse humanitarian action, it can be very different in different situations. So in the GHA report, they talk about local NGOs, national NGOs, national affiliates. So for example, your local branch of the Red Cross or World Vision, which is which has a local governance structure, but is also part of a bigger bigger family or federation. Southern Southern INGOs as well. So, for example, BRAC in Bangladesh has now gone global. Is another example of that. And what I what I think is key is, yeah, NGOs will always compete with fun, for funding because the donors have decided that this is one of the ways that they they improve our performance. But the the world of humanitarian action is very diverse and. Um, we need to have different configurations of civil society in different situations. So in an India or in a or in the Philippines, it's a completely different set of attributes that civil society needs to be effective in achieving humanitarian outcomes compared to a conflict um, situation where neutrality may be a lot more difficult or where um, the funding mix may be difficult, as Sophia referred to earlier when she shared her things about different things. So in in Nepal, for example, when she was sharing her slide that said more funding comes from that, from business in, in the Nepal earthquake, that creates a different set of options for civil society than if you compare it to South Sudan or Syria, where basically it's a lot more institutional funding from, uh, you know, in South Sudan from the Europeans or the Americans, which, which require a different set of rules, or the Middle East donors in the Syria crisis. And I think that we need a diverse approach to civil society where there is a place for everybody who's relevant at the local and national level. And that that includes local NGOs and it includes what has traditionally been considered to be INGOs. And I would just say that I really welcome the increased emphasis on listening to local actors that's in the grand bargain and that has been in the discourse from the World Humanitarian Summit onwards. So. I think, Melissa, to save time, that's probably an answer to that question and also a good summing up for me of, of my points on the seminar. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and thanks to, uh, to all of you for, um, for your participation in the Q&A. It's been really, uh, really enlightening. And uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Melissa uh, to briefly highlight a few of the, uh, the key points um, that came out of today's session. Thank you, Anne Hurd. Um, the key takeaways that I would take just uh, from this, just for, uh, at an immediate view, would be first, we, we really heard from Sophia that we have to consider international humanitarian assistance in a context of wider resource flows. If it's only 4.8% of the flows that are going in, and we, we see huge flows from remittances, et cetera, um, we should definitely be thinking outside the box. Also, um, although we have a year on year increase, and record highs with the uh, international humanitarian assistance, including uh, flows to NGOs. It's not keeping pace. It's not enough. It's concentrated on mega crises. Um, so we do have a funding gap issue, and we it's hard for us to trace the flows. From Cyprian, I think we should all pay attention to his uh, advice. Uh, he's encouraging NGOs to really feed information about needs to help donors prioritize where they uh, 
allocate limited funding to really um, follow closely all of the discussions related to pooled funds and we saw this with the question on the SURF uh, with country-based pooled funds and with several NGO run pooled funds there's a lot happening in this area that we can get to in a future webinar um, he also told us to pay attention to cash um, to a lot of discussions on uh, localization taking into consideration donors constraints and from Julian we really got into the detail about the UN uh, complexity of engaging in partnership and uh, pointed out several areas that we should be following um, as a grand bargain is now entering its implementation phase um, several opportunities for NGOs to address uh, the localization issues and access to funding and um, really teased out some of the challenges about defining who are we talking about. Um, we do still operate in an environment of competition and we have diverse actors and we need to um, complement one another. We heard from you via the polls that the vast majority of uh, the vast majority of you think humanitarian fi financing should be defined by the activities it is spent on and there are some trans formative trends related to cash, localization, pooled funding, and there was no one big obstacle faced. Um, there's issues with reporting, the UN complexity, and an issue that several of the uh, NGOs in the network of ICFA feel is important is this whole issue of capacity building. So at the end of the day, we've outlined several challenges for financing, but also pinpointed some very specific processes underway to tackle these challenges. And and emphasize several times that there are um, uh, there's a real need for collaboration and people working together in different networks to to tackle these because it is an area of common concern. Excellent. Thanks so much, Melissa. And now we'll turn to uh, first Cyprian and then Sophia uh, for your own very brief uh, closing remarks, if you'd like to share. Uh, over to you, Cyprian. Uh, yes, so very briefly, I think we are in a, in such a, a, a transformative way of, of responding to crisis. It's not only about humanitarian crisis, it's about the overall uh, world which is expanding with wider resource flows that are getting not available, but at least we can see it. And so we should all reflect on, on, on that. Uh, you have new ways to respond to crisis with new actors, and, and this is challenging, but, but you, you still have to to, to get together and, and, uh, and help in the reflection. So thank you. Uh, thank you, and, and over to you, Sophia. Uh, the, the world is changing. It's changing fast. The threats that people are facing are changing um, and changing fast. And humanitarian financing and the wider financing landscape is changing. Maybe not so fast, and maybe it needs to do more to catch up, but there are promising signs. And within all of this, there's a real need for clear, accessible data, both on the full spectrum of resources available and on where it's going and the needs of people, the fully sought out needs, both in terms of poverty and humanitarian assistance um, that, that people are facing. Now, we're doing our best to try and present that data in an accessible, informative fashion um, for you. Please do get in touch with me if you have ideas, gaps where you think that we could be um, providing uh, more information, looking at different things and making it more accessible to you. I look forward to your feedback and thanks for your participation. Okay, great. So thanks once again to both of you uh, and also to Julian, who I think uh, just had to, to leave us. Um, thanks so much for being with us. Um, that now brings to a close uh, the substantive part of today's event. A, a very good start, I think, to this series. And um, uh, we're looking forward to the next coming up. Um, I would like to mention that the uh, the recordings uh, and the mentioned resources will be available uh, from the PHAP website in the next days. Um, they'll be on the event webpage. You can see the link in front of you there. We'll also be emailing this out, of course, to everyone who registered for today's event. I'll also highlight, uh, as was mentioned in the chat earlier, that um, there will be subtitles uh, for the recordings in both French and Arabic uh, to increase uh, further the accessibility. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we are very excited about the upcoming webinars um, because what we were thinking of uh, as a network when trying to understand financing is we wanted to understand better the particular flows of financing, um, looking at um, working in partnership with UN agencies, uh, looking in partnership uh, with pooled funds, bilateral funding, private funding, etc. cetera. Um, we also wanted to open a further topic uh, for early next year based on uh, the demand and interest from you. Uh, what do you want to know more about? What do you want to discuss? We're going to reach out to you um, throughout the learning streams. Um, so we definitely look forward to getting your feedback and input in the closing polls. Feel free to suggest topics on humanitarian financing for a future session in the survey that's going to be displayed. And uh, we are thinking through after the webinars, what would we like to do to continue the conversation? And we're exploring options now to create some kind of mechanism or platform to allow you all to discuss with each other um, from some kind of peer-to-peer -peer discussions to share information. We've already seen from the chat box that people have very interesting uh, views and uh, we definitely benefit from uh, bringing more voices to the discussion. Okay, great. So um, uh, we'll have just a few uh, additional brief remarks here. So as was already mentioned, so the learning stream, um, the current learning stream on humanitarian financing is broken up into a series of five topics. Um, the very next one uh, will be taking place on the 12th of October. Um, so you have uh, the information there. Uh, it will be entitled Demystifying NGO Access uh, to Humanitarian Funding. Um, as you know, UN agencies often partner with international and local NGOs to implement humanitarian assistance and protection, and understanding how the UN partnership frameworks function and how humanitarian funding through the UN is evolving will be the topic of the second session of the learning stream on humanitarian financing. Uh, we'll be bringing uh, together with ICFA experts from two major agencies, UNHCR and also the World Food Program, who will present their organization approaches to implementing partnerships and will discuss challenges related to the existing funding modalities uh, together with bringing in an NGO perspective. Um, then uh, we saw uh, the calendar of additional events um, coming up. I'll, I'll give the floor once more to Melissa to uh, make sure I'm not missing anything that she would like to, to come in on here in the closing remarks. Thank you. I just wanted to mention one thing. Uh, based on the discussions we're having in these webinars, ICFA will uh, be working with PHAP to develop um, briefing papers, so you will have some kind of written content that can supplement what we've been doing here um, over these series of webinars. Thank you so much for uh, the partnership and all of you for uh, your great participation. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So that does finally wrap it up. Uh, thanks once more from me and then also uh, to the uh, the ICFA team and the PHAP team uh, here behind the scenes. There are a lot of people involved in putting together an event like this with hundreds of people. So thank you so much uh, to all of you for uh, your efforts and uh, we look forward to seeing you once again next time. Uh, please be in touch. This is Anne Herod Lang signing off from PHAP in Geneva. <laughs>